write it. And well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to many of you who are here live with us on our Cultivating Voices live poetry. It's our Sunday new book showcase for the month of September, our September showcase. We're so, so looking forward to this reading tonight featuring uh, three poets who are undoubtedly going to be an incredible constellation of poetry for us this evening. Before I get started, I uh, just wanna welcome you all. I'm your host, Sandy Anone, author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And it is always my pleasure to be with you uh, on the Sundays when we gather. And for some, it's Monday actually, but for me, it's Sunday here in, Sunday afternoon in the Pacific Northwest of Olympia, Washington. And I'm just overjoyed and delighted to be able to welcome our three poets for today. Kacha O'Neill, McCullough, Sinead, and, <laughs> and there's a little music to accompany my <laughs> introduction today. Kind of like that courtesy of Michael Sims, our third reader today. If um, you were hoping to see Tave niece today, unfortunately Tave was, is not able to join us today and we're hoping to be able to feature Tave at a future reading uh, here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And uh, we just send our best wishes to Tave with our thanks uh, for uh, with our thanks for agreeing to come to, to the new book showcase. And uh, we're again, looking forward to having Tave return um, when she's available to read with us in, in a future new book showcase. But for today, uh, we have, as I said, this, this incredible trio of poets, uh, Koch, Sinead, and Michael. A little bit about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry before we turn to the poetry for today. Well, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry began right at the beginning of the shutdown for uh, the pandemic. Uh, our first program was March 29th, 2020. And we came, we came live on every Sunday for many, many, many Sundays in a row to allow poets to gather and share, commiserate and process, uh, and also make sure that there were venues for poetry. And it's been a remarkable, remarkable journey these three years. So we're so excited that our fall season, our third fall season, is upon us and that um, and that we've moved differently uh, through the pandemic. One of the things is we've continued to grow immensely. Uh, we truly, truly live up to our, our billing as an international, um, of an international poetry group. We have over 3,500 members that are participating on our Facebook page uh, at, at, diff at different levels from literally all over the world. And when I was thinking today, I realized that in fact, we have probably had folks read from six, of the seven continents at one point or another on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. So we are an intergener international, intergenerational, intersectional poetry group. We, uh, we aspire to be incredibly supportive and uh, engaged with the poetry that arrives on our screens and at our doors. Uh, for our listening pleasure, 
and edification. And, you know, I like to also think, I know this is true for me, I've met so many remarkable people, uh, befriended people, uh, networked with people, and it has just been um, it has just been a remarkable, remarkable journey. So again, I'm always grateful for the audience members and all the poets. So thank you for coming today, but also thank you for your steadfast support throughout um, throughout these many throughout these many months, and look forward to many, many more. Well, let us turn to our poets for today for our new books showcase. As I said, we love, we love the format of the new book showcase. It's so wonderful to be able to continue to support and, uh, and hold the space in the different formats that we do so that we can hear individual poems in a kaleidoscopic way in our in our wild card open mics. And I especially love when we're able to bring um, the new book showcases where we get to hear uh, a more concentrated, a more concentrated experience as we hear more from a person's body of work um, in this particular format. And as I said, today we've got three astounding, um, astounding poets, and uh, we'll be hearing two of them through their work in collaboration with one another. I'll be introducing each individually, uh, and, uh, and we'll get to hear, as I said, a, a wonderful selection from, from their latest works. Well, first, I'll be introducing to you Sinead McClure. Sinead McClure's poetry and prose have appeared online, in print, and on the radio. And I have to say about Sinead that the very first time um, I heard Sinead, which I believe was through um, when it was not the time to be silent, now Lime Square Poets, I heard her sound and I said, that is a radio personality. That is a radio, that is a radio person. Oh, it's astounding. Well, Sinead's most recent work can be found in The Stinging Fly, Ink, Sweat and Tears, Live Encounters, Mark Ulysses, Fabulous Live Encounters, Step Away Magazine, The Ecrastic Review, and on RTE Junior Radio. We love RTE there in Ireland, Northern Ireland, RTE Radio. Sinead won the 2022 Cathal View Poetry Competition and the Oval Five Word International Poetry Prize in 2021. And if you've not participated in Oval, uh, that is quite, quite an accomplishment. She is the 2022 recipient of the Roscommon Chapbook Award and her chapbook, The Word According to Crow, will be published in late autumn 2022. <laughs> her chapbook, The Songs I Sing Are Sisters, co-authored with Koch O'Neill McCullough, is available right now, today, from Dreitch Press. And we're, again, I, I love when we're able to feature these, these works in collaboration with, with each other, uh, poets in collaboration with each other. So thank you, Sinead and Koch, for bringing uh, this work to our stage today. Thanks so much, Sandy and Kim and Don for inviting myself and my sister poet Koch to read for you tonight, today, from our collaborative chapbook, as Sandy said, that's the songs I sing her sisters. Um, it's been a beautiful journey in collaboration between us, uh, starting when Koch asked me if uh, we'd like to collaborate on some poems, and this turned into a conversation between us. Uh, it's a meeting of minds, and we found so many connections, so many um, coincidences in our stories. We still do. But Koch and I have yet to meet in real life. 
The stories and songs reflect on family, loss, mother and father, mother earth, togetherness. Some topics became a surprise. Other are the stories of migration many Irish families shared, for we all come from somewhere and we meet each other's passing by. So I'm going to read a few poems and then I'll pass over to Cochin, who read a few more. And if we have time, maybe we'll come back and read a couple more as well. And for this set of poems, I, I'm kind of going to concentrate on that theme of family and father, mother and migration. My great great grandfather traveled through Ellis Island four times. The last time he never returned. And the family story goes that he was killed after being thrown out of a bar in New York. Whether that story is true or not, he did leave this earth as a relatively young man, a father of four, one of which was my grandmother, Alice. But I found out some years ago that this man, James Lydon, was actually born in Australia and his father came there some years after the famine from Ireland. Irish people have been moving around for many, many years, but the home place is never forgotten. Homecoming. My great great grandfather left Victoria at age seven. The outback faded to orange on the horizon. The wave gradient shifted from turquoise to navy blue. The wildness of Australia never lost its hue. My aunt left for Victoria, aboard a 50s passage to a new world. Hugs faded from the platform, out of reach, marooned in her heart. My mother named distance a street of goodbyes. People were always leaving, always waving into empty spaces. When news came of my aunt's death, the gulf grew even larger, for there's no good way to travel there. My sister left London, a swaddled toddler held in the arms of the Irish Sea. We are children of the returned, who know to be devoid of homeland is to be forever lost. It's in the ripping out, the detachment. It's in the map of vacant eyes and darkened hearts. It's in the shape of our fodder and the raven tumbling in from cirrus clouds. And it's westwards and it's never coming home. On a similar topic, thank you. Um, the next poem touches on ancestors too. I'll go and find it in the book. Um, and when I said that James Lydon was born in Australia, his father, Michael, was born in Sligo. I didn't know that when I moved to this county. Uh, I didn't know that Michael followed the gold trail to an unknown land. And from 1860 to 1874, he lived in Keelor in Victoria, Australia. And he was an inn owner uh, during the gold rush. This is where he met his wife, Hannah Evans, a strong Welsh woman. And they had three children. I didn't know that when Michael and his family returned, he came to live 10 miles from where I live now in a place called Boyle in County Roscommon, where my mother was born many years later. So I, I moved to this place of rolling countryside, of the Kesh Caves, of the Karakil Tombs, a rich historic place, not knowing, actually, I also belonged here. And, and that belonging runs very deep, I think, particularly with Irish people. I came here 25 years ago to this place of my ancestors and it gives me a comfort. There's a familiarity in the landscape. There's something resolved within me. I actually don't feel properly at home until I cross the River Shannon traveling westwards. And when my dad passed away, I heard him call out, out there in the darkness of that rolling landscape. But my dad didn't come from here at all. Rather, he followed me here, lullaby. I hear wolves clamour from the past. They stand on Kesh Karan, pack tilted moonwards, hackles glowing beneath Jupiter. Is it just a distant howl of wind caught in the grey willows? I hear my father call out in his sleep long after he is gone. It's the neighbour's cattle lowing about, 
arguing over the best bit of field or the warmest spot in the coldest corner. Our ancestors walked the world from here. Their homes lie indented in the hollows. Ring forts richly decorate each perch and acre. I can hear their children laughing, soft breaths ghost-like as last year's John o Gold harvest. Kilty Tig, Kilnahari and Kildargan Moor, forests without trees. The wolves grow closer, cries rounded by the breeze that licks at this hill. I fold myself into sleep. The wolves grow closer still. Thank you. An apparition of my father. I see his shape in the shadows, tiny pinpricks of light, static trickling in the corner of my room. I want to go to him, pull that form around me like a cloak, but I just lay here and watch, weighted with the stillness, this faint contour swinging like stars in the dark. I was born on, on the East Coast in Dublin, actually. Um, and this is where my parents returned to. Uh, they met and married in London and England. And after which they honeymooned in Kalini, which was my father's home place. And my mother fell in love with the sea and the landscape. And eventually she made him return home. And my eldest sister was a small child. In poetry, I often think of them both now as younger people, people I didn't know. And this poem I wrote for them, it's called Sunfish. They anchor at Dawkey Sound. Da's brown arms shake from the crossing. Earlier, he stirred basking sharks awake. Dark shapes circled the boat. Mam clutched the picnic, careful not to spill the wine. Her laugh rose wild as her ash blonde hair in this offshore breeze. Now, as they lie together, the silence is dull blue, a deep scratch on the sky. And the unwieldy beasts, those sunfish, resurface, water pilgrims at the island's edge. And the last poem I'm going to read for you in, in this set um, concerns another coincidence between Katja and I that we found while we were doing the collaboration. This one was kind of a surprise and I let Katja fill you in because I think she's going to choose the, the, her poem on it as the first poem of her set. But um, it's a small poem which speaks about my father's romantic side for he loved literature, but he was a working class man. For those who might know the, the um, geography of Ireland and think of Kalini as one of Ireland's places of the rich and famous, a.k.a. Bono, etc. Um, that, that wasn't my dad's Kalini. My dad uh, grew up in the lodge of a big house. Um, that's where my grandmother cooked and cleaned. And my grandfather was head gardener and chauffeur. It was upstairs, downstairs. Maybe a little bit of the hoi polloi may have rubbed off on him, but I like to think, and I know that he was just a very clever and well-read man for a welder. But he loved the Brontes, and he particularly liked Emily and her wuthering heights, and he was charmed by these dark tales. So much so that he said he'd call his children after the Bronte family children. In which case, I am Anne. In another life, we were named after the Brontes. In this one, our father's romantic notions stalled after the first of us drew breath. He'd read enough not to christen sorrow, not to utter sepia words that come in rain and dark dog moorland. He knew Branwell had painted us all together and then later erased himself, calling it clutter. I'm going to leave you now and hand you back over to Sandy and then Koch for a little while. And I'm looking forward to hearing her read as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been you've been hearing the poetry from the collaboration. 
between Sinead McClure and Katja O'Neill McCullough. The, the, the new chapbook, The Songs I Sing Are Sisters. Well, let's turn to the second sister of this dynamic duo, Katja O'Neill McCullough, and, uh, and hear some of the poetry from her contribution to this, to this just, ex, just exquisite, exquisite pairing. And, um, I'm, and I'm excited that we're gonna get to hear uh, a few possibly extra bonus poems uh, from the two of you uh, after. Well, a little bit more formally about uh, Katja. Katja O'Neill McCullough is an ethnocologist who started writing poetry in December of 2020. So months into the months into the, the, the deepness of the pandemic, her poems are published in print, online, and in exhibitions, including in Northwards Now, Poets Republic, Poetry Scotland, The Storms, the great new, the great new journal that's, that's just come out. Um, just in this past month or so. Dreitch is the edge of all storms and not the time to be silent, collected works. She has won or been placed in various competitions in Scotland and in Ireland, including the joint winner of the Dreitch Classic Chapbook for what we're featuring today, The Songs I Sing Our Sisters. Katja's writing on Scottish culture appears in books alongside works by, among others, Andrew Motion, Irvin Welsh, and Kathleen Jamie. Currently, she's working on a new collaboration with the artist Rachel Hall and a collection invited by a publisher. Katja's also in the midst of surviving cancer and uh, has been kind of poignantly sharing that journey with those of us who are connected with her on Facebook and continued healing and robust health through this process to you, my dear friend. And again, I also remember the very first time you came on to the Cultivating Voices live stage and shared with us. And it, it has been a marvel to have you be a member of this community and uh, again, so glad that the that you and Sinead joined together for this for this powerful work. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sandy and Kim and Don, for this generous welcome um, to share something of our journey and our poetry, the, the, the correspondence of friendship and words that Sinead and I found together um, during this uncanny time that we're still experiencing and through which uh, cultivating voices and uh, not the time to be silent and line square have been the loam that have really, um, that have really given uh, the, the good ground uh, for the generation of, of, of our work together. We've really been nurtured by your generosity in constantly welcoming and supporting poets and poetry. Thank you for that. Stormborn. Cold misted breath. I read each cutlass blade of grass. Great gilded gale glided gusts. Billowed winnows of filsket fibre. Set adrift hair razors. Filaments flamed, fearted. Ignited by the terror that such liberties could blaze their heat riven hearts. I knew to know them then, kindrift, splayed branches, betrothed between trees, my people cleaved to Brunty folk. I heft in uncan comfort to you, storm bandroe, Brontes who birthed the sheet sweat wet that fevers every mind that craves freedom unchecked to all spill primal passion and to be the pulse that pounds this world to love. 
So Sinead shared um, that, that in her last poem, that connection to the Brontes through her father's lyrical poet's mind. And when she shared that poem with me in what became a correspondence between us, a virtual correspondence um, uh, where we put up our, our poems on, um, on a drive online and we would uh, respond or comment. When I saw her poem, I Am Anne, I had to say to her, my goodness, I must respond to this. Wait till I tell you, Sinead, I'm related to the Brontes. Um, and for those of you who know, the Brontes or Patrick Brontë, the, the vicar who, uh, who brought his four children to Horath Parish, um, where they wrote in that incredible heady environment of, of the moorlands of Yorkshire, was actually uh, an Irishman from Fermanagh. Uh, from the borders of Fermanagh and County Tyrone and um, his Brunty folk are also my family's Brunty folk. But this was just one of many connections that we discovered um, writing to each other in poems as well as, as speaking in words on various Zoom calls and meeting each other um, in the weekly sharing of poetry, be it in, in Lime Square or Cultivating Voices or in those early days in the not the time to be silent meetings and getting to know the cut of each other's jib. Um, and kin, I think, became a common sensibility between us, that sensation that although, as far as we know, we're not related, although we are all part of the one human family, that sensation of having found an answer to a question we didn't even know we were asking, we find that often as poets in the words of other poets, that sensation that we are not alone in this world. And between us, we created um, a, a bridge across the wee sea between Scotland and Ireland. And that sense of kinship extended, not just in our poems about each other and our families, but also a sensation that we were speaking the world at a time when it was the very connection between us as, as human beings, the connection to all life that was constrained in the pandemic lockdowns, that, that inability to express our very humanity, because no, none of us want to be isolated and no poet wants to be alone. Our very lifeblood is the, the life and livings of the people around us and the people who have touched us in our hearts in our memory, in our minds. So we shared the sensation of kin and often our poems reached back into that, uh, that past that Sinead has talked about, that family heritage and further into our sensation of being part of the one human family. Kin. We place palms to your futures, set, stretch sinuous span beneath the skin thin of time. These lips we gild with ochre, spit life to this rock, paint our breath to your eyes and sing kin into the earth. We language land and sea, open-handed we speak them, right named, we warm the world womb, capture the stars to light you to it. Listen. Your song is spiralled in stone, in water, and in the underthought of words. Trace it in the carry of your life stream. The crease which folds your hand is the wound that remembers us, an opening to bind us to you, and we have poured all our wisdom there. So Sinead spoke about the... Uh, the theme of migration, which was very strong in, in the poetry between us. My parents also moved to London and stayed for longer than Sinead's. I was born in London and became part of that country uh, to the east of Ireland um, and to the west and to the north and south, which is known as the diaspora. And uh, that history of migration is rooted for my own family, who are from Kerry in the west of Ireland, in a a series of marginalizations, movement of people from land that was uh, fertile, fecund, to the more marginal lands of the West, a history of clearance and of great hungers. And this was the story that was told to me as a child um, of my own family heritage. And in some ways, the connection to which uh, I, through which I understood my own parents' migration from an Ireland that was 
um, still living its post-colonial uh, legacy in the 1950s. So this is a poem for my mother and for her people in Kerry. My mother, who we were never sure which day she was born on. She was born sometime around midnight between the 14th and the 15th of November. Naming. A place will know many names. The first is found in its becoming. It is made from the mouths it feeds, how they speak the very dark of gloaming or the sky as she mourns the departed sun. They sing her name over mirrored pools where the moon gives her face to the stars. Other names are tight, coiled, sprung. We call them eviction and hunger. They ink the earth and map her fields, fence her unyielded to the woodbine. These names are arrow-tanged, barbed to tear and unskin lips. They take place and unseat wisdoms. A house can be full-lived and well-fed and yet never know itself a home. It is not the remembered house, not the one that loved your laughter, nor the haven that washed your feet in Skelligs and at Loch Coran, cool slaker of Lunas athirst. There the Atlantic shared herself, gape-mouthed, salmon-wise, storm, she blew you into being, swam you through two moons, bore you like a fable, a flame flickered between two days and two names, one written, the other your own. Thank you. Migrant. I was precious. Seed carried nomad, secret in the folds of my parents' hopes. They sailed moons to blow me to this shore, where I found my feet and let them step me to your heart. The songs I sing are sisters to your stories of roots and soil, and they're older, made deep in time. Before this earth was measured into pockets of gold, songs unfurled from the people who walked it, feeling its seasons move them from ebb to ebb. They frayed its coasts, close chased the colors of shoals. I sing to spill yearning into these waves, to push myself hard to the wind's resistance. It returns me to you, to this hold fast place, to the between house of becoming and belonging, here to tie the grain knot around my migrant's heart. I hear your song, it is iron on stone. In the bog, it weeps your tethered dead. Root it there, bind it with place and time, with people and blood. I go to hear their whispers, they are memory and now. I go to ask for homecoming, to know that the dead want us to live. We place them upon swan's wings so that they might fly and we put their ashes to the storm, then watched as they turned the sun for us. The bones you keep in stone, they are way markers only. Look again to the sky and you will see the stars. This canopy of care will guide and shelter all. Thank you. So one of the pillars of the, the songs and a pillar for all poets um, is, the, is love. It was very much a sensation that Sinead and I shared that there is so much love that has carried our, our journeys and the, the, the way in which our poems have been formed, our own formations, including, and not the least, those who have the patience to love poets. And so this is a poem I want to dedicate to all our beloveds including Ivan and Joe and all of you who are here tonight. We shared, many of you who've shared this journey with us. This love. Oh, there are many kinds of love you might regret. The queasy softening of your spring cream knees as a boy or a robin tilts beak up and blush chested to trill down into your nest ready heart and steal it. 
The dead Spaniard eyes of a silver crowned sparrow, love in the constant uncolour of cloud covered sky, lead and ash its promise, fierce, unfaltered, faithful, calling, could he hear forever under steady eaves? You might never regret the love for you alone, goose gorgeous, down nested and mounded in, moss habit, lichen love that can only heal. You'll find it on the lee side of the sun. Large and all black mortal is a raven's love, a passerine one to sing life's end with. And what if this love is all that yearns between sky and earth? Regret it not, this love will call you home. Thank you. So um, I'm going to just read one more poem <laughs> on this part of the set and before I hand back over to my sister poet, Sinead. Um, and it's a poem, like many of our poems, a poem about family relations. And we wrote a lot about the mammies and the daddies together. Not all our, our poetry made it, of course, into the the chapbook and we keep saying to each other we have more work to do on this but certainly in those stories of our families were stories of loss and our living with loss I suppose was another reaching out to speak the world together in this time of pandemic there has been a great deal of lived loss felt loss and we really wanted to um, to express and share our our being alongside, being with and for, not just ourselves together, but with, with all of the world in those experiences. And in the ways that our own lived experiences can open our heart, deepen our compassion, deepen our empathy. So this is a poem from my father, Moholis. You'll not find him here, he is not in these words. Once oak hard beneath the peat, like butter, he has slipped to softness. My father is not in this place. He has walked the map of his palm, followed the course of its life stream. Behind him, the river has thinned to tears. He travels a hollow way east. It is the road to the winter house, home to the rags and bones of human love. There he will hang up his life heavy heart. Discover the amber of deepest time, and in him it will become fire. Bright two of the fires we have set on the bog, 1,000 flames to light his turn to the west. And in the liquid sphere of this heather blaze, he will become again like a mountain. It is there you will find him after these words, after this, my father, all light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pach. And I, I think we're going to turn back over to Sinead for... Have we time? I don't want to be taken. Yeah, oh, we have time. We have time. Okay. <laughs> we all get a little bonus rounds from the three of you today. So okay. beautiful. I'm going to ring, read just two more for this. And um, one that... Um, I, I love you, Koch, by the way. I love that beautiful reading. Um, just beautiful. Um, this one is a hope of spring, but it, it, it's also um, hating to go into this time of the year over here and we're getting into the darker evenings, as you can see. <clears throat> it's called Eilid Lorok. First, it is the sound of children laughing, then hoots, howls and bellows above the tree line. This is the whoop of spring's arrival. Forty arrow the sky, narrowly missing the tops of the Scots pine. Each day more swans leave, climb higher, fly faster. They are leaving the lakes, leaving Gara, Key, and Gill. When a pair fly late, tell them hurry up, and they will. Until the equinox casts shadows and they raise voices once more, fly towards a mid September sunset. Finally, it's the sound of children crying. Thresholds by Koch O'Neill McCullough. 
Tell us. Tell us of thresholds as your mother tell them. How when houses burned, they were saved, the doors. Hungry, roofless, emptied, scoured, but for this salvage heart wood kept to protect fresh hearths, make home. Fourteen let leave to live out from that ashy shade. You slipped, shod, followed a circus dreamer, Colleen Oshlingok. Fleeing to Sneem, you, the road lifting your feet from Atlantic coral, dusting them in saffron, Monbrisha's scarlet fingers firing your flit to hope held whirls, your heart, it fell, a weighted door, slammed and locked at the screeched break of the Garda's bike, pushed out for you from Sneem. Saddled with loss, dream-broking returnee, your trapeze wings clipped and folded, tear-dripped. Cry them, shut-eyed, drowning walls hefting you heart-sick, home-struck, keeping you parlored up, apron-stringed. Until one usual day, again dulse shod, berry filled adrift, your feet fled the whale road, set fair. Twenty, unknowing then, that each leave you would take would fit the steps of all who crossed before. These thresholds, those many doors. Thank you, Shanique. Are we still okay to do a little more? Is he okay? Love you too, Shanique. <laughs> and this is a, a poem for all poets. Birth, to remind me that the sun will return, I paint ochre onto your body, this unruly lull of limbs and hair, and I chew the deer's hide soft, make a shroud of teeth and hooves for you, birthed but never born. Wings clipped at your moment of flight, I bury you among the mounds. They circle this turf like beads of coal. Your body I give to oil, and quartz to this necklace of jet and bog. Cradled upon the wing of a swan, stories swarm like beetles from your grave, carved between the care of earth and stars. Torn from a throat, tarred with tears, they fall like arrows from a bow and tell of swans and geese and hungry women who hunt. And each tale is like a fawn lost in the forest, in the quietening we hear its pulse. People who will always be poets will search the whole world ebb for your stories. They will tell how the fire ochre sun opened your wings and how you fanned its flames all about the earth. And final from us, I think, We Were Stones by Sinead McClure. My mother collected stones. They lined her windowsill, all shapes and dialects, accents of other shores held in every roll of tide that shaped them. They tumbled behind the mailboat over the ashen sea and oddwards to trains, platforms, rows of typing pools, to Trafalgar Square where there were more pigeons and pebbles lost in the shale gray of smog that always took her breath away. Picnics at Parliament Hill Fields, swimming at the Lido. No rocks, just clear, cold water in fresh Italian blue. Her body, a fresco of calm, watercolour strokes. She never imagined the sea could be a lake until she saw it. The curve of beach, each stone and pebble glistening like a gem. Thank you, Papa Light. Thank you so much. Kacho Neil McCullough, Sinead McClure. I have to say, I've been looking forward to the reading for so long. And I and I was 
I was full of anticipation. I, I knew I would be moved. Uh, and, and yet I still was not prepared for how exquisite the reading and the weaving of the poems became as, as I sat here mesmerized and moved by, by the work, as, as you said, Koch, the between place between becoming and belonging. Uh, I, 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 I just love how the two of you became to belong to one another in song as sisters. The chapbook recently out from Dredge Press is The Songs I Sing Are Sisters. I also can't help but feel that echo of the, you know, the, the narrative threads that you're talking about, the family that, and the migration, famine, hunger, and I hear those. I hear those echoes of Ivan Boland as well in the work, and and uh, uh, just just uh, just an absolute moving experience for me, and I'm sure all of us here. And we're so grateful for the opportunity to be able to listen to your work tonight. Thank you. I'm 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 just I'm just choked up by the whole experience, quite frankly. Well, we are always, always so fortunate here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry because we get to hear one exquisite poet after another and also get to welcome folks who are, you know, incredible contributors to the poetry, the, the poetry citizenship that makes up the fabric of what all of us in this room aspire to do. And I think an incredible model of that is our next poet, Michael Sims. So I'm incredibly, incredibly honored to be able to share this information with you about our next poet, Michael Sims. Well, Michael Sims has worked as a squire to a Hungarian fencing master, a stable hand, a gardener, a forager, an estate agent, a college teacher, an editor, a publisher, a technical writer, and a literary impresario. <laughs> I might add giant. <laughs> I'm going to add John. Michael identifies as being on the spectrum and a survivor of childhood sexual abuse who didn't speak until he was five years old. And we are grateful for your voice in those years since when you began to speak. He is the founding editor of Autumn House Press and Vox Populi. In 2011, he was recognized by the Pennsylvania Senate for his contribution to the arts. And his most recent books include two poetry collections, American Ash and Nightjar, and a novel, Bicycles of the Gods, a Divine Comedy, it is, tr it is truly my honor and pleasure and great joy to be able to hear your voice today, impresario Michael Sims. Thank you, Shannon, and also Kim and Don for inviting me to be part of this wonderful showcase. I feel very honored to be here. I'm going to read brand new poems, which I've written just over the last couple of months, including uh, one which I just finished a few days ago. These poems have been inspired by two gardens I've known 
and worked in. Uh, both the garden behind my current home in Pittsburgh, where my wife and I uh, have built a garden, and also the garden behind the home in Houston, Texas, where I grew up. This first poem is called Persimmon. And uh, the persimmon described here is the Diospirus tejana, uh, a species indigenous to Texas and Northern Mexico, which produces a small black fruit similar to a plum. It's very different than the different species than the persimmon that you buy in grocery stores elsewhere. Uh, these uh, usually grow wild, but we had one in our backyard. I was raised in a house in Houston with a large garden where I was expected to work every day. I didn't mind because in the house there was always shouting and hitting <laughs> while outside I could enjoy the peaceful song of cicada and chickadee, the beauty of azalea, flowering pear, the scent of sage, laurel, and the taste of fig, pecan, persimmon. For me, autism was a gift of silence and solitude. As Shannon said, I didn't speak until the age of five and then only with a heavy speech impediment. So I do to the natural world. Persimmon. Nothing changed the first year, although I felt the white net of mycelia spreading around the roots and the leaves learning to move through sunlight and shadow the way I was learning to move easily through the seasons because I couldn't speak. Each October, the leaves fell, joining the layer of humus. The wet leaves froze in the fall, decayed in the spring, fed the new leaves in March, and all summer crickets sang, and also robins, and in high pines, a crow called. In the third year, I saw a spoonbill fly overhead, forming words out of air, but no one listened. The sapling spread until it filled a corner of the yard, and we had to move the tomato patch to the sunlight, and later the garlic and parsley. I was supposed to be baptized, but refused, believing only the dark and light of the garden. Each year, Diospiros filled out, growing lush and tall. In the sixth year, flowers appeared, then green fruit which yellowed. We spat the astringent flesh and placed the basket of fruit in the cellar to ripen. After a week, the persimmons, hard, crisp, and sour as crab apples, darkened, sweet as peaches, dusky as plums, and we ate them greedily. All but one I left on the windowsill, an experiment in sunlight. The last persimmon was soft, a small black sack I bit open, and my mute tongue welcomed dark honey. This next poem is called Hatred. It takes place in our back garden, my wife, where my wife and I live. And we both work very hard in the garden and we're proud of it. Um, at one point, this nasty vine started growing. It was full of thorns and it was a bramble and it sort of took over the garden at times. I was always chopping it back and I really hated it. Uh, and eventually I found out it was a blackberry bramble. <laughs> and so uh, we found a place for it. This is a poem called Hatred. Out of spilled coffee grounds and banana slime beside the compost bin, a gangly vine grew, twisting out of shadow into slats of light between the boards of the deck above. I hated the way tough thorns of rubus drew blood whenever I passed, the way a suckering root held clay and stone in a thousand fingers, never letting go, choking the softer roots of elderberry and cherry. 
stealing water from roses and sweet shrub and milkweed that fed the monarch. This bramble, this briar patch of demon weed was killing my garden, so I investigated poisons. Triclopier kills dicots, leaving grasses alone, but would kill the roses and azaleas as well, maybe me. <laughs> but still, I was crazed with hatred for this weed. I sized, mowed, axed, hoed, trimmed, yanked, and eyed with vicious intent this intruder eating my garden. But the satanic bramble would not die. Then, in the spring of the fourth year of my war, the arching canes ventured small white blossoms whose yellow stamens attracted bees. And in midsummer, green berries turned red, then black, and a tanager perched on the compost bin, feasted on the dark droops. The berries tasted sweet, the hard seeds insistent on my tongue. I resisted pleasure, then succumbed. This next poem is called The Garden, and it's based on the garden in our backyard, but it's a science fiction poem. It projects into the future, uh, into the collapse of our civilization, which we all can see around us at this moment. Um, and so it's a projection into the future, the garden in the future. The garden. Our iPhones told us of fires in the West, floods in the South, the great cities of the North and East were erupting. Chaos reigned everywhere but here. Our neighbors stopped by with gifts of strawberries in the spring, tomatoes in the summer, squash in the autumn. And we in turn allowed our neighbors to gather the fans of dark fruit from the grandmother elderberry in our backyard and the stubborn blackberry at the edge of our property, long believed a weed volunteered its abundance to all. The first year, our dog grew lean and happy, hunting rabbits, squirrels, and deer. The empty lots became wild fields, surrendering a bounty of dandelion, purslane, and burdock. We threw away our iPhones and rummaged books for old remedies. In the night sky, stars appeared, and constellations long forgotten were known again. A blimp, trailing the rags of an unreadable banner, disappeared over the horizon, and then nothing in the sky but the godly sun looking down. And when the first generation was old, we learned to praise, and only then ugliness left our lives. We gave thanks at the evening meal, slept the sleep of the just, and woke to the sound of larks. Crows in the high trees also spoke to us. The flute abandoned in the attic for years was lifted into song. In the evening beside the fire, we told stories of flying machines and moving pictures. The rusting hulls of automobiles were stripped of metal for tools and tires were shredded to make shoes. And in the second generation, after we'd learned the language of crows, the trees, began to speak, and we, the people of the garden, began at last to listen. This uh, next piece is a, a love poem. Um, do I have a few more minutes? Uh, this next piece is a love poem. It's called Trust. Trust. I want to hear about the time you were hurt and the many years you couldn't trust yourself. I want you to trust me as earth trusts the rain and the season welcomes our hands in the dirt. When the new shoot lifts its head, soil still clinging to its chin, the root has barely started its journey, 
unsure of its way through the dark, what is hidden, what is revealed. When I walked into the room, you were reading so deeply, I tried not to watch you. Outside, it was gently raining. When we were young, our love was a storm shaking the trees. The neighbors shook their heads in disapproval. Now we are old. Our love is the moon tangled in the limbs of the pecan tree and the neighbors barely notice. Tell me when the pecans begin to fall and I will meet you beneath the boughs, search in the fallen leaves for the dark fists of memory where laughter carried us through the long evening. When you see me becoming smoke and ash, it is the beginning. I will wait for you on the path. Uh, just a short three line poem here called Flight. Like a fledgling on a ledge, you will discover your wings only if you let yourself fall. And I think this will be my last poem. It's called Rosamund and the Rain. My grandmother, Rosamund Delee Sims, was, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, crazy as a loon. Uh, she was manic depressive, bipolar. Uh, when she was down, she was very, very down. And when she was up, she was wonderful. Uh, funny and charming and brilliant. And she played the piano when she was on her, on the height of her cycle. And she would improvise and beautiful things. She, she had only a brief lesson when she was a child, but had always been around a piano and it just taught herself to, to play. And she just make up things as she was, as she was sitting there. Uh, one time, she was so good that one time a neighbor of ours heard her music coming through the open window and he later said, oh, your grandmother plays Chopin so well. <laughs> it was her, it wasn't Chopin, but it was like Chopin. It was light and lyrical and brilliant leaps. So here's a poem called Rosamund and the Rain. The rain knows more about us than you think, how it finds the smallest spaces between your neck and your collar, your love and your fear. My brother and my sister, one who refuses to speak to me and one who can't speak, having passed at her own hand years ago. Every rain recalls every rain. Sitting at the window as a child, seeing the trees fill with wind, pulling at their roots, feeling the rain fill the spaces in the soil, quenching the long memories. My grandmother in her mania, inventing riffs on the piano in the next room. The first time I heard Chopin years later, I realized she'd been improvising on memories of her childhood. Our bodies have absorbed the music of the rain, and now someone is calling me from far away, and I know her voice, how like the rain it is. So thank you very much. Everyone, you've been listening to literary impresario. <laughs> I just like saying the word impresario. Michael Sims, for whom I give you the moon. I give you the moon, my dear Michael. That reading, that reading. I resisted pleasure, then succumbed. You all remember that line. And uh, what a thing it was to succumb to the poetry of Michael Sims today. Uh, the newest collections are American Ash and Night Jar. And I have to add also that I too do battle with the Blackberry Bramble in my backyard. And in so much so in fact that this weekend I was down, 
I was I was down visiting some friends on the coast here, and my and I was wearing I'm been wearing some shorts, and my friend is like, "What the heck happened to your legs?" And I was like, "It's the blackberries. Oh. It's the blackberries." And I'm gonna go do battle with them again just after the reading today to go pick some more. So I want to also just you know the the poignancy of the connection between the power of your observation and the desire to encourage us to listen, to listen, to listen. That is the power of poetry. And that is what encourages us to speak those truths. What a what an absolute incredible reading from Michael Sims. And of course, we began our hour with the songs I sing our sisters from Sinead McClure and Koch O'Neill McCullough. How about we unmute and show our absolute appreciation for this beautiful trio of poets that we hear here. Fabulous, Bravo, fabulous. Bravo. Right. Oh, whoop, whoop, whoop. It was amazing. <laughs> what a reading. From all time zones, my friends, from all time zones, listening go. to y'all tonight. And we are all the better for the fact that we were able to hear tonight from Sinead McClure, Katja O'Neill McCullough, and Michael Sims here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry's New Books Showcase, our September New Book Showcase. With great appreciation, of course, to Kim Ports Parsons, Don Krieger for arranging and holding this space for us to be able to listen to this to this trio. Uh, and of course, a few of you had maybe expected to hear Tave Niece, and we promise that we'll bring Tave back for an incredible reading. And maybe we'll bring Michael back to join in that reading with Tave. I, I know the two of you really had looked forward to reading together. And boy, we would, we would, um, we would blow the roof off off the computers uh, to hear the two of you in conversation with each other. So much, I love the idea of conversation and poetry. It's reminding me also of, of, of so many poets that have, have written in that back and forth. And one, one book that comes to mind um, is William Stafford and Marvin Bell's Segways, a conversation in poetry. And if you if you if you've if you've never um, experienced that book, you might take a take a peek at take a peek at that one and look that one up. But so so Sinead and, and Kotcher have, have really uh, tapped into what what I hope will continue to evolve more and more as something that poets do that 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 drive not to be in isolation and then to not write in isolation to write in conversation love it well what a conversation we've had today here on cultivating voices live poetry i mean kim i see you sitting there you're shaking your head i'm shaking my head i'm like I've been crying, I've been laughing, I've been sighing, I've been guffawing, I've had the whole gamut of emotion. And isn't really that, isn't really that what poetry is about, is really tapping into that gamut of our emotions. Those that we know are there on the surface and those that we did not know were yearning to be free and poetry brings us forth. Poetry brings us forth. Well, I hope that many of you will come forth next week. 
when we will be hosting our September wild card open mic. As I always like to say, you are the features. You are the features. A reminder that if you would like to read in the open mic, signups are fifth, begin 15 minutes before the top of the hour, depending on your time zone. That's why I always say top of the hour, um, because for me, it's noon Pacific, but for all of you, it's in different time zones. So at the top of the hour, 15 minutes before the top of the hour, they've been filling up rather quickly within minutes, within minutes. So please do arrive early uh, if you are eager to sign up. We usually will take about 12 to 15 poets and I do try to get to that wait list and, and try to curb my tongue a little bit so I can get as many poets in as possible. Well, it's very hard for me to, uh, to not continue the accolades for today's, for today's reading. Uh, so again, a, f a final, a final thanks again to um, Sinead McClure, Katja Neil McCullough. The, again, the, the the new chapbook is the songs I sing our sisters from Dreitch Press, as well as Michael Sims and whose latest collections are American Ash and Nightjar, folks. We've had we have in the chat here for those of you here live with us in Zoom. We've got the links to uh, to their books, and of course tomorrow we'll be posting those onto our Cultivating Voices Live Poetry Facebook page for those of you who've been watching um, through Facebook today or or watching um, this on the recording. I do hope that you all will, to the best of your ability and if resources are possible, invest in poetry, purchase one or both or three or all of their works, all of the works. And again, I hope you'll all join me, Sandy Anone. Uh, your humble host here, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I hope you'll join me, Kim, and Don next week for our wild card open mic. Until then, until then, my friends, as I always say, take very good care of yourselves. Take exquisite care of your beloveds and keep writing so that we can keep listening to your remarkable poetry. I look forward to seeing you next time. Be well. <laughs>